Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you all very warmly to this webinar of the World Bioenergy Association. My name is Christian Rakosch. I'm chairman of the association, and I'm very glad to see that we have a lot of attendance to this webinar. We have over 300 people that have been signing up to join this webinar on pellet production in developing economies. Now, uh, you may have asked, why are we looking at this topic? Uh, pellet production in developing economies is not very common yet. It is very common in a number of industrialized countries, but not so much in the, uh, in the south of this world. Well, uh, the reason is precisely because there is a big issue with unsustainable biomass use. Uh, in many places uh, with uh, very uh, uh, low economic development, biomass is used directly uh, as firewood uh, for cooking, for heating, and it's creating problems, problems of sustainability, uh, uh, overuse of wood because the use is very inefficient, exposure to high uh, amounts of, of, of air pollutants, which has big uh, health issues. So we want to get rid of traditional biomass use and replace it with modern biomass use. And to do so, you do not only need improved cook stoves, you also need an improved fuel. And pelletization is a way to create an improved fuel. And that is why we are focusing on this topic. Uh, Traditional use of biomass is 40% of all biomass in the world. It's a very, very big chunk of energy that is being produced under uh, conditions that are precarious, that are inefficient, that need to be improved. And that is why this is the topic of today. Now, before I start introducing our speakers, firstly, let me tell you, uh, please participate, ask questions and use the chat. Uh, the chat function is in the bottom of, 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 of your screen. And if you have anything to ask, uh, just write it into the chat and we will try to answer your questions after every presentation. Also, before I am going to introduce the speakers, I would like to shortly introduce you to Alan Sherard. He is the editor of Bioenergy International. It's uh, an excellent uh, uh, journal that is official partner of the World Bioenergy Association and that is helping us a lot in reaching our audience. Uh, Alan, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening uh, to every, everybody participating at, at this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, thanks for the, the introduction, Christian. It's, it's indeed a, a, a wonderful pleasure for us at, at Bioenergy International to be, to be actively involved in, in webinars such, such as this. Uh, very briefly, uh, as you mentioned, we're, we're a trade publication focused on, on biomass to energy, uh, solid liquid gas from cook stoves right up to combined heat and power plants. And precisely for, for, for the reasons that, that you've already outlined, uh, we, we have a very keen interest in putting uh, Africa and other emerging economies on the biomass pellets map, quite literally speaking. Uh, one of the publications we have is our annual pellet special, which we take a, a sort of deep dive in, into the, the world of biomass pelleting. And the whole combination of, of, of biomass pellets and, and clean cooking stoves has the ability, has the potential to change the narrative here in Europe on deforestation in general. And that is something that, that we need to, to, to look more closely at, uh, not least as, as, as a trade publication. Uh, finally, just, just a word on that. I'll, I'll be in, in, in contact with, with, with the, the speakers uh, in, in due course with a view to uh, the, the coming issue of, of the pellet special. But I would also ask any, any of the, the participants at the, at the webinar, uh, get in touch. If you're operating a, a biomass pellet plant somewhere around the world, let us know about it. With that, I'll, I'll leave it back to you, Christian. Thank you very much, Alan. Now for the speakers of uh, today's webinar, we have 
a range of different viewpoints that we'll have represented. We'll have the viewpoint of a consultant, Martin will be, uh, Martin Knot will be uh, presenting his ideas from a perspective of a consultant on what is necessary uh, to set up a successful pellet plant. We will have the voice of science. So uh, Magnus Stahl is going to give us some basic information on what needs to be taken uh, into account when pelletizing different materials. And most, of, most importantly, we'll have practitioners, folks that are out there actually producing pellets and reporting from their experiences. And these folks are uh, uh, scattered across the globe from, from Mexico to Africa, all the way to India. So you'll get a really wide uh, uh, impression on, on the different uh, experiences that are there. So thanks uh, uh, to all of the uh, presenters. And with that, I'll hand you over to Martin Knot, uh, a consultant which has a long uh, uh, experience in the pellet business. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christian. And indeed, I'm a consultant now, but I used to be a business developer and even manager of wood pellet plants before. So I'm speaking more out of my track record, you could say, than out of my, my, my current role. But uh, thank you, Christian. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to meet you all. So Martin Notes, I'm the founder and manager director of uh, uh, Hinterland Management, my consultancy firm. Been active in the biomass sector for over 20 years, mainly out of the energy utility industry and been involved in the development and assessment of many wood pellet plants all over the world, from large scale industrial to, to small scale, and held also board positions in several operational wood pellet and wood chipping facilities. So for today, I would like to share my experience on that with you today in this webinar. Um, so second page, I hope you also see the second space setting the scene now, Christian, yes? Yes. Excellent. Very good. Well, it's all about feedstock. Uh, you probably will understand also from the other managers and operators from wood pellet uh, facilities all over the world that it's really all about feedstock. So if there's something really as a takeaway for you today for me to address, it's about feedstock. But next to feedstock uh, as the no-brainer, we're also looking into biomass supply chain structuring and assessment. Um, wood pellet production options and safety first, definitely uh, also looking at safety, particularly with a wood pellet facility with wood dust and business development from a risk-based perspective. Um, the pictures, I have many pictures here. Some of you probably will see this as familiar, wood chips on the top, uh, a press in the middle with a die and um, wood pellets in the cooler on the bottom. Just to uh, give Martin, you a Martin, we are still seeing the first slide. I'm not sure why no, this. Now it's okay. okay. Now we, yes, now, it, now we see the second one. Thank you. My, my apologies. So yeah, so top section, wood chips. Middle section picture is, uh, is pellets. Uh, the pellet press with the die and the top, and, uh, and, and the picture below is uh, wood pellets in, in the cooler. So basically an overview, uh, as I indicated. So uh, just go to the next slide. Now, now we're, we're okay, Christian, right? Yes. Very good. Well, the supply chain itself, um, in the end, um, it's about the uh, section in the middle, the biomass processing, the wood pellet section, what we are addressing today, wood pelletization, the wood pellet plant. However, it comes with a full supply chain upstream, so on the left-hand side, as well as downstream on the right-hand side. So after pelletization, you will have storage logistics, logistics, and in the end, the use we're looking at in this webinar is advanced biomass cook stoves, so pellet use for cook stoves. So basically, we're looking at more like a domestic or regional application, not a seaborne uh, export location. And then uh, on the left hand side, we have the myriad of options to get your feedstock, to get your diet, your, your supply intake, um, where if we are looking at supply intake, um, well, the big, I would say one of the biggest issues for wood pelletization is a continuous flow of um, um, applicable, affordable, sustainable, and available feedstock. So before uh, developing a project or throughout the development of a wood pellet project, uh, my mantra for biomass assessments, which I'm doing actually now as a consultant for, for, for clients, 
is really starting to look at availability, not the hypothetical the theoretical or scientific availability, but actually are looking at all the hiccups and, and limitations of aggregating biomass, logistics, uh, sourcing, security of supply to come to a realistic volume of availability. Looking at sustainability, uh, especially in Europe, as Christian indicated, that's a serious issue, but also I would say in, in developing countries, sustainability, land grabbing and whatnot really is a, a serious concern to address. Applica applicability is, is about the technical side, so the chemical composition, shape and whatnot. And obviously in the end, we are looking at fiber, which needs to be um, uh, affordable in, in, the, in the business development modeling. So we, are, we need to look at affordable biomass in the supply chain for a wood pellet facility. Ideally, you look at wood chips, uh, sorry, wood uh, sawdust uh, already dried. Uh, that was your ideal starting point. But in reality, that's not what you get for your full diet. So besides sawdust, uh, then you're lucky if you're getting some dried sawdust either you move up uh, to, towards uh, whole lock chipping, um, uh, energy cropping, you will have higher prices with an acceptable quality. Uh, on the other side, you could move down into the quality range uh, towards uh, forest residues or more branches and leaves or even agri residues. So your price will go down as the, the residual value is lower. However, it comes at the price that your quality, it will be reduced and is to be mitigated. So for sake of time, um, next slide. Uh, so if we get into pelletization, so this, this picture is a bit of a teaser. Uh, you might see someone who is going to present. Um, so if we're going for pelletization specifically for biomass cookstoves, but I mean, there is a way out that you will not pelletize at all, that you just feed the cookstoves without any pelletization product, dried uh, husks, um, macadamia husk, palm kernel shells, etc might work actually do a pretty decent job. So you could feed the, the, the cook stoves without pelletization. However, it comes at a limited availability. So a significant risk of feeding your, your customers uh, having, um, having purchased your, your cook stove. So that's a risky business to go without pelletization. With pelletization, you widen your feedstock intake. You go simple, meaning only dry sawdust. You press it and there you go, low investment but it comes with a limited feedstock intake or you go advanced pelletization. So you include chipping, you include drying, which means that you, you widen your intake uh, range, uh, more moisture, uh, diverse products. Uh, you can take even branches and whatnot. So that's the trade off you will have to make as a developer, whether you go simple or you go advanced, higher investment, with more options on feedstock. Uh, everything is having its pros and its cons. And I would say in Africa, we see somewhere between simple and advanced. Really advanced is like the massive half a million tons a year uh, and Viva Drex type of wood pellet facilities. Simple actually might be the way forward or somewhere between simple and advanced for smaller ranges like uh, producing maybe 10 to 20,000 tons of, 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 uh, of wood pellets. Well, if we are looking at um, business development and structuring of a pellet plant. My take in the end is position yourself in, uh, on the chair of the funder. In the end, banks, soft funders, uh, donors, um, um, uh, regular funders will look at a pellet facility from a risk-based perspective. So if we put our risk head on, and that's basically the hurdle you will have to take for funding is really about addressing. So. Um, identifying and addressing all the risks a banker will address. And I've listed here just nine or 10, but you can even list 30, 40 of them. But at least being aware of risk and addressing risk is a way actually to structure a bankable business plan where you will get the funding. And also in the operations, you limit your operational risk. And if we're looking at risk, it's really about safety first. So. For the ones who are operating with wood pellet plants, no news there. For the other ones, uh, very simple and straightforward, there is always an imminent risk when you're working with airborne wood dust. I mean, wood dust is just fuel. Airborne wood dust plus oxygen and a spark, and a spark can come from rotating equipment. It can come from, uh, um, from any kind of ignition somewhere in the pellet facility, and you will have a risk for explosion or even a real explosion. 
just as an example in the USA, pellet cooling machine, not really dust, but still working with wood, destroyed the entire manufacturing hall a couple of years ago. And there are many examples here. So wood dust safety, but also pellet safety and feedstock safety is very important. But also wood dust is having an impact on operators. So um, respiration, uh, breathing is important. So uh, protecting yourselves uh, for dust and noise, managing dust is important. So I'm just list, have listed certain risk mitigation measures for, um, for health and, and safety. Obviously dust management, airborne and settled is very important, but also just thinking about what if scenarios. So what if some kind of a worst scenario would happen? How can I anticipate to that beyond the regular, I would say dust management or dust risk issues. So just uh, as a takeaway on this slide, um, airborne wood dust is dangerous and needs to be managed not only from a safety perspective, but also from a health perspective. Well, looking at risk in more general, and more general for, for business development and developing a wood pellet facilities towards bankability, towards funding, you will start with an inherent risk if you develop a project. Um, and gradually by taking risk mitigations or risk management steps, you can reduce your risk level even at the business development stage before funding to a target risk management, which will be acceptable by funders. By initially looking at risk mitigation, right? So any risk you can quantify and exclude from your project is, is already mitigated. Well, the residual risk, if you can allocate it to a third party, for example, a supplier, it's excluded from your project. The rest, if you can hedge it, if you can ensure it, for example, hedging on feedstock or hedging on, on offtake, you reduce your risk. And there is a certain threshold of a controlled acceptable residual risk you can work. But if you think ahead on, on risk management and apply these steps, I think some projects in Africa um, would have been avoided, uh, could have been survived where in reality now they have stranded based on feedstock supply chain and also stakeholder and sustainability issues from a risk perspective. So looking at risk more in detail, how to quantify risk? Well, this is a risk heat map, not specifically for biomass, but, but we can apply it for wood pellet facilities as well. Just looking at the impact of a certain risk and the likelihood of a risk. Well, if the likelihood is very high, almost certain, and the impact is catastrophic, that's really a very severe risk. So you can map all your risks in your development stage of your project, your wood pellet project. And what you would like to do, obviously, is push those risks down from the bottom right high critical risk side to the more manageable, moderate, or even low risk side. Um, by doing that properly then and taking all those risk mitigation measures, you should be able at least to push most of those critical risks to a more uh, a moderate uh, risk level. And just as an example, which is my last slide for today, is that if you do such a risk uh, management uh, procedure for business development, you could, this is just a snapshot of certain risk in a, in a wood pellet facility specifically for, for biomass cook stoves used. Then, you will see, for example, two critical risks of very high likelihood and high impact, for example, on, on feedstock as well as on feedstock pricing and then the mitigation measures and so forth and so forth. You can see that some risks are then moderate, some are high, some are critical. And in the end, you can even redo this, uh, this heat map uh, with the risk mitigation measures and to see whether you have pushed down those risks. So basically, as my final takeaway for, for today, it's really about feedstock. So if you have managed your feedstock, if you have controlled your feedstock, I would say you're already, already half, halfway there to at least structure your wood pellet facility towards uh, bankability. So thank you very much. Back to you, Christian, and um, looking forward to address your questions. In time, Christian? Perfect. Perfect, Martin. Many thanks. Yes, there have been a, a couple of uh, quite interesting questions I would like to forward to you, Martin. And the first one is, there was a comment, well, wood pelleting is creating a significant energy demand for the processing of the feedstock. Can it still be considered as an environmental friendly process? And also another question was, what is the benefit of using pellets compared to using firewood? Can you comment on that? 
Yeah, so if we're looking at the energy efficiency or the carbon neutrality of, uh, of wood pellets, uh, there's been a lot of research over the past, I would say 10, 15 years, especially from the industrial side of wood pellets, where we're looking at the energy consumption of the entire supply chain. So not only the wood pellet facility, but also upstream and downstream. Um, the drying uh, normally is, 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 is being executed with hog fuel, which is a very low grade uh, residue, more like bark ish. So you're not using gas, normally not using gas or oil to, to dry, um, to dry your, your biomass. You're using your own product, your low grade product. So if you're looking at the carbon neutrality on the supply chain, we're exceeding normally 85, 85%, even up to 90%. So somewhere in the 80 to 90% of the wood pellet in the end, including all transport, is CO2 neutral. There's only less than 10% of, um, of uh, fossil energy being used in that pellet, which is basically in an upstream in, in the forest. So that's one. So basically, it's, it's still uh, not basically, it is uh, part of the renewable energy mix, and it is very efficient and carbon neutral if you're looking at the total supply chain. Uh, well, secondly, if you compare wood pellets to, to charcoal, well, with charcoal, uh, especially in Africa, but also other countries, there the traditional way of charcoal making is really like chopping entire trees and making it in a very inefficient, uh, simpler way, uh, a charcoal, which is um, really pushing deforestation, which what, what you will see um, in the suburbs of, uh, of, of, um, of cities in, in Africa, for example up to the level that Kenya, for example, is even banning charcoal because of that. With wood pellets, as I've indicated, if you go advanced on your wood pellet scheme, you can really go down in your, in your supply chain to agri residues and products which are not competing with other users, which are not enforcing deforestation. So I think, especially if you go uh, with a bespoke wood pellet facility, you will definitely avoid deforestation and, and use low residue products um, uh, replacing charcoal. I would like to add to that, uh, Martin, that uh, pelletization also allows to use agricultural residues rather than wood residues uh, if you use them in, in gasification cookstoves. Uh, and I think that opens up a resource that hasn't been used at all in the past and that opens up a lot of uh, possibilities in rural areas, uh, uh, which I find extremely uh, uh, interesting. One thing you did not mention, uh, and that relates to the benefits of using pellets compared to firewood, is that a pellet cook stove is burning entirely smoke-free. So a gasifying cook stove fired with pellets is completely, it, it is almost burning as well as an LPG cook stove but the cost is a third. So there are significant cost benefits uh, compared to advanced fuels like LPG. Uh, and there is very much, uh, much more beneficial in terms of emissions and also efficiency. You'll get 40% efficiency with an open fire. It's like 15% efficiency. And with charcoal, the overall efficiency is even much lower than that. So I think yeah, indeed, uh, uh, indeed, Christian, I think uh, Marion and Conrad will probably elaborate on that as they're involved in also the stove side of it. My focus really was the, the fuel side of, uh, of the okay. business here. There was one, one last question, Mark, uh, uh, Martin, that I would like to put to you, and that is, um, can you give an idea of the capital expenditure and the operational expenditure? Well, the question was for a 100,000 ton plant, which is pretty ambitious, but let's let's make it a 20,000 ton plan. Where would you lie with uh, a CAPEX, with OPEX, approximately just to give an idea of an order of magnitude? Obviously, we know it depends on many factors. Well, this is a tricky one because there are so many variables. So the first question is, do you go simple or advanced, as I indicated? Then that could double the price, right? So if you only take a press and some logistics and, 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 and a shed and a warehouse, then you could be a few hundred thousand euros, uh, for example. Uh, but if you really go advanced with a dryer and a hammer mill and a chipper and whatnot, then you're easily a few millions out for, for 20,000 tons. Um, so it is difficult to, to, to address also, are you going for um, uh, Chinese equipment? Are you going for European equipment? Are you going for refurbished? But ballpark figure, I would say for 20,000 tons, somewhere between half a million and, and maybe three, four million, depending on the, well, the, uh, the advancements of, of the pellet plant. 
Now, assuming that you have dry raw material, uh, what order of magnitude are we talking about when we're talking about operational ex expenditures? So how, how much are the production costs per ton? What is the range? Obviously, well, it depends very much on the again, it very Again, it very it depends, for example, your electricity bill, right? So electricity, so your uh, electrical motors consumption is, is, is a major component of your O&M. So it is difficult to give specific, but in general, you could say if you take industrial size, so let's say 100,000 tons, for example, ballpark is, you take about, uh, so if your, your cost price is, let's say 140 euros per ton cost price, you will take 45 to 50 uh, euros per ton for your feedstock in pellets. You will take the same range, so 45 to 50 euro euros per ton for your conversion, which is then everything, your consumables, electricity, um, uh, labor and whatnot. And you will have another, let's say 30, 40 for logistics. So that's the ballpark figure industrial. If you go smaller scale, I would say it very much depends. Basically it should be the same range. Normally it's a bit more expensive especially electricity could become a larger uh, uh, percentage of your o &M if you go smaller scale as you're losing you're losing on economy of scale that was very helpful to give an idea of where we are just one final question regarding the electricity i mean uh, if you have intermittent electricity how do you deal with that when you're running a plant well maybe that's something that uh, conrad can then probably refer to yeah, I would say two options. Either you stop production or you have a genset, but the genset normally makes it a very costly exercise, but I'll leave that to Conrad. Okay, we'll leave that to Conrad. Great, Martin, that was very, very interesting. Thank you so much. And we'll head out now, head on now to Marian Peterson. She is the Chief Operating Officer of Emerging Cooking Solutions in Zambia. And Conrad Klingenberg, he is the plant manager at the pellet production in Zambia. So uh, the two of you are uh, going to share with us your experiences with producing pellets and selling stoves in Zambia. Uh, uh, Marion, the floor is yours. Okay, hello? Hello? It's fine, we are hearing you, Miriam. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Christian, very much. And thank you, Martin, for everything you have just explained very clearly about um, the pellet production. Um, so I'm going to do the presentation, but Conrad, please jump in at any moment. Um, my presentation is very much just about our experience, my experience of eight years uh, working in Zambia. Um, and uh, so it's a very short history of our pellet manufacturing in Zambia. And um, so just, I hope you hear me. So just starting from, um, um, the, so basically the goal of why we came here was to replace charcoal with pellets uh, and to be able to, to manufacture pellets in Zambia. Uh, when we came, there were no, there was no market for pellets. There was no manufacturing of pellets. Uh, there were no. St there were basically no st stoves for pellets. But we came with this idea, um, and so. And the third point was to be able to procure and provide stoves. Um, so our core idea was to produce pellets from waste biomass uh, as fuel for cooking stoves and sell it cheaper than charcoal. So our goal has always been to look at the charcoal price and to cut it in half uh, and sell a stove and, and pellets. Uh, we came with very little experience. We didn't know, we had little knowledge of, what, of making pellets uh, and we had um, very little funds and there was no market. So in these pictures, you see the two uh, people who, the real founders who are basically Matthias and Per and I am the third founder. Um, Company. So this is just a quick, I don't know if you see the full slides. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick glimpse of uh, charcoal uh, manufacturing, uh, how it's made in, in Africa. Uh, so you cut down big trees, you take the best logs and the best branches, you, you cover them with soil and you smolder them to make charcoal. And it is a very dirty 
an unhealthy process and you lose, uh, you need about six tons of trees to make one ton of charcoal. Uh, this is what uh, it's like to cook with charcoal. Um, it's very dirty, it's, it's, it's time consuming, it's very expensive uh, and it's very, in terms of for the women, it's a lot of, lot of time loss and a lot of health problems for themselves and their children. Uh, when we came, we saw there was a lot of available biomass. What we saw as being available biomass, and I think Martha knew a good point about sawdust uh, being uh, hopeful of uh, biomass, but it's actually, it was, it's wet, it deteriorates quite quickly. Uh, so we have discovered um, that it's not ideal, but we've been using it. Um, this is, I have a little movie, but maybe you shouldn't try to see it. It's just to show you the typical kind of small um, sawmill uh, in, in Zambia. Uh, this was our first pellet machine um, that we, we arrived in 2013. Uh, it was a bus kirk, a very small little machine. Um, and if you are able to see the little movie, which I'm not sure you'll be able to see, you'll see how much we did not really know how to use it. Um, it was, oh, sorry. Uh, and so we, we, sorry. So we, um, it was producing, uh, I can't see my full screen. We can see it moving, so don't worry. It's, it's all right. Okay, good, sorry. Okay, all right, sorry. So, so, we, so we had this very small pellet machine and we made our own uh, pe pellet stoves because they were, they were called pico pay stoves. It was something that we, we manufactured in Zambia. And this is showing the first stove made and the first time cooking on it. We were cooking on it in the factory and, and then there's, a, there's a, 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 um, a woman cooking here. Uh, then by 2013, we did get our first serious pellet production, which was a Swedish press that did uh, 300 kg an hour. Uh, we had two presses, as you can see in the picture, there were two presses, but uh, generally one was down. So we always had one or the other working at every time. Um, the reason for this is that we always, there's a lot of lack of spare parts, a lot of unexpected um, difficulties like uh, the power uh, being very une uneven uh, power, uh, electrical power um, and the biomass being uh, very um, different too. Um, so this is a movie I would like to show about this pellet factory. These are our pellets. I hope you can see it. It was a, a perfect small fa pellet factory for the needs we had at the time. And here you can see there's only one press working. Uh, and then I just want to give a sample of issues that we had with that press and that we was, uh, we found, for example, a handful of glue in the press. We had no tools to, to be able to work it. Um, there was a lot of wear on the gear and the pellet, um, um, the pellet, uh, Typically, people resellers and people who would have our pellets uh, had a hard time understanding that there was a, that there was a water issue with pellets. The pellets will become sawdust if you don't have a, a nice place to put them. Uh, this is a picture just to show the type of stoves we were using at the time. So there was we found uh, we were able to what we've been doing is always procuring the best stove we could find and making affordable making it affordable to people by giving them pay as you go system so that they they pay it over a long period of time and that the combination of paying for the stove and paying for the pellets is half the price of charcoal. And in the back, you can see a stove that we have, we designed, which was an institutional stove that worked with, uh, for the very, very big um, um, pots. Uh, this, this is just, I just wanted to quickly talk about marketing. So we were marketing to, through women's groups and schools. Um, and then one day, the 17th of October, 2015, our the whole factory burned down. We were hosted in the Co Co Copper Belt Forestry Company, which was a pile of, 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 of wood 
Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, after the very dry season, of, after about six or seven months of dry season, uh, a spark uh, was initiated in that factory and burned our factory completely to the ground. Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking, Martin, of what you said about how, how everything uh, that is very, very highly volatile, the, the pellets. Uh, after our fire, we, we were able to get a Chinese press uh, because what happened with the fire is that it was we were insured in local money and the money had the value had completely dropped. So we were able to afford um, a small Chinese press and a Swedish press, and we we struggled quite a bit uh, because of lack of funds. We moved we had to move it from place to place, um, and uh, the fact the, the small Swedish press was able to produce maybe one pellet an hour. It was very very inefficient. Um, in 2017, we, we decided to, uh, in order to support the, our pellet and stove uh, business, we decided to uh, also add solar uh, to the equation of our, of our business. And so we, bought, we, would, we, would, um, we, were, we were rewarded with the grant, uh, the Beyond the Grid Fund, and we were able to, um, to, to continue producing pellets and selling stoves. Uh, but also selling solar lights. Now we, this is fast forward to now. Now we have uh, a wonderful factory, uh, which is um, managed by Conrad. And I think Conrad, maybe you could talk now about um, the pellet production uh, that we have and the factory and what everything that you've done to make it function properly. Conrad? Conrad? Maybe you need to unmute yourself, Conrad? Okay, it's supposed to be. Okay. Yes, now we hear you. Very good. Okay. All right, there you go. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, yeah, my name's Conrad Klingenberg, and um, I've been with, uh, with uh, ECS for, for about a year now. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade, and basically, um, I've had the the job and the, the fund to commission and upgrade equipment. Um, so I'm, I'm not by any means a pellet boffin. <laughs> okay. Um, but I do, I do solve problems and I've been able to make quite a difference, I think, to the operation here. Um, yeah. So all, all the fun and games that you guys had early days, um, I wasn't part of that, but I have been able to, to be effective in the, in the, in, in the new facility. Well, it's not new. It's actually, um needed quite a, quite a lot of work anyway so um just what i've what i've kind of picked up and gathered um and in the last 12 months um i think this business is is an amazing business uh to be honest i think it's got a lot of future um and so um a few things that i've kind of learned in the last 12 months is um cash flow is king okay budget 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 it's all about the money and as Marion has, has um, already said, uh, to try and build a business on a shoestring is not easy. It's, it's gotta be tough. Um, and so the, the question I would, I would ask, do you buy refurbished equipment or do you buy new? You know, how much money do you have? Uh, do you mix all the new equipment? Um, and so what the operation here, um, a huge factor in terms of cost, I would imagine has been, we have to collect all our biomass. And over the last year alone, there's been an incredible shrinkage of biomass available close by. And so now um, our, our truck has to go further and further <laughs> to go and collect biomass. And it's becoming an expensive operation, I think, in that term. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, also part of the equipment, apart from the, 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 the processing equipment, there's things like, you know, um, lifting equipment, um, forklift, front end loader, um, how to move raw material around, all these sort of factors come into, into the equation and they cost money. Um, and another big one here for us in Zambia is how reliable is electricity? Uh, and wherever you want to be and put up your, your setup, um, electricity is a big one. Um, is your transformer big enough to handle your demand um, for power? and also for your, um, the, the expansion phase of your business. Another big one is biomass quality and accessibility, okay? 
um, we primarily um, use pine, okay, but we also have hardwoods that get thrown into the mix, um, eucalyptus and other indigenous hardwoods. Um, and so um, we, we have to secure your biomass source. Okay, that's a big one, as, as Martin has, has already said. Um, so in Zambia, as, as Marion has also, has also said, there is no real biomass industry per se up to now. Um, however, we believe there are really huge potential for this industry in Zambia. And thankfully, there are many folks out there as, as to this webinar that, um, that a lot of people know what they're doing and there's a lot of information and help available um, to help in times of need. Um, all right, so the biggest factor I've, I've also can come to realize is um, the, the, sing, the biggest single critical factor is, is the moisture content of, of the bio and mass raw material. Um, and so we, we don't have a dryer, okay? And this is, this is like, wow, uh, we use the sun to dry our, our biomass and the sawdust and even the 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 the, the yeah um, the sticks and and branches all get sun dried and then when they sort of close to the 13 14 percent then we chip them and we then um, hammer mill them and then try and get uh, the, the content to be to be down to 13. So in the rainy season we have a problem we have a huge problem <laughs> um, keeping the stuff dry and yeah, it's, it really is an issue. So um, I'm told that a, a dryer is probably the most expensive equipment to actually operate in this in, the, in this kind of business. Um, all right, so some handy tips that I've kind of picked on. Okay, your equipment needs to be suited for the to handle your type of biomass. Okay, what do I mean by that? All right, like for example, a fish food pelleter or a cat or dog food pelleter requirement. Um, is different to a wooden pellet uh, machine, all right? Um, we have a lovely big um, hammer mill, all right? And the, our, our chipper is really also, <laughs> it's a challenge. And so the, the chips aren't always the, um, the, the, um, the same size. And I had to remove one of the motors and, and um, um, machines inside the dryer, I mean, inside the hammer mill, um, just to be able to process the, the um, bigger chips. So your equipment has to be suited for the kind of biomass that you have to process. Um, I think, yeah, um, when you are starting a new operation and you have to um, commission equipment and make alterations and modifications, probably helps to have somebody on board who's either mechanically minded or uh, some kind of engineer kind of a kind of a person who can think outside the box and solve installation problems with creative ideas and able to troubleshoot and problem solve effectively. Um, I think that's been a bit of a plus for me. I'm able to do that, I think, quite well. Another big important thing to have is have a very smart electrician. Okay, uh, I'm not an electrician, all right, and so we have a really good electrician and I have a good welder or boiler maker on board. Um, and so we've had to really be able to, to, to make ideas and be, be creative in our problem solving. Also, it'll, it'll be helped to have a good workshop um, on site where you can really get involved and, and create things, make things and change things as you need to. Um, All right, so there. sorry, I, okay, we're back again. All right, um, I've come to realize also that magnets are your biggest insurance. Um, Ma, we've had stuff coming through our hammer mill that's completely smashed the screens, um, and magnets are such a big, big um, necessity in, in the business. Um, the more magnets you have, the better for you. Um, and so we've had, my goodness, we've got some some stories about that. We've also had a fire in our um, dust extraction facility. Um, so that was also scary. Um, and so Martin, he came and saw us a little while ago and, and he said, it's not if you're, gonna have, if you're gonna have a fire, it's when you're gonna have a fire. And so he's, he's made it, he really 
improved, um, showed to us the need for dust control. And so that's something that we are working on as well. Um, all right. Um, I've also had to include um, de deflector plates um, within the system, especially within the, um, the press. So the, I had to make sure that all the dust, sorry about that, oh, there you go. So um, I had to put in a, a deflector plate into the press to make sure that all the dust, all the sawdust coming in actually goes over the magnet and I've installed two extra magnets as well. Um, yeah, so I could go on. Um, another important one is to, to minimize the physical handling of your pellets, all right? And so we, we've had to be hand, hand handling kind of the pellets. And so the need for, for um, mechanical equipment to actually move bags, put them on pellets and forklift um, and minimize the, um, the touching of, of the bags to, to stop the creation of, of dust inside the bags. Um, all right, I'm kind of running out of ideas here. So I think I'll, um, I'll leave it at that for now. Many thanks. Many thanks, Conrad. Um, uh, one thing you mentioned to me when I was asking you what was, uh, what was your conclusion from uh, setting up and running this plant was uh, build a ah. new one rather than using- uh, uh, Okay, uh, sorry, come again, circuit. say again. I, I recall that when we had a conversation ahead of this webinar, you mentioned- um, Okay, I can't uh, hear you. You cannot Hello? hear me. Uh, can What's everybody going on hear here? Me? Bardwaj, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Christian. Okay. We can okay. Hear. All right. Okay. So, sorry. Come again. Okay. Uh, you commented uh, to uh, me that. You okay. Hear I me. can't hear you. Okay, Conrad. Why don't can't worry. I hear you? Um. What about Marion? Marion, can you I hear can... me? Yes, I can hear you. I will. I will put the question to you, Marion. Um, oh there was, dear. There was I a completely question lost you guys. There was a question in the uh, audience uh, in the chat. Why is the biomass source declining, as you said? There was, or I think Conrad mentioned it. Um, yes. What is happening? Why is there less biomass around? So uh, the, the biomass that we have been um, uh, getting is uh, from a plantation of pine and eucalyptus that was um, a peristatal. And that, uh, so we were getting off, off cuts from them. Uh, we were also getting sawdust from forestry companies that were getting their wood from those plant, that plantation. The problem with the plantation that it, it was that it was very poorly managed. So they missed many years of, of replanting, uh, you know, the, the, the steep- Hello, the can you hear me now? They would posts, sorry. Um, so, so it's 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 basically because the source of biomass, which was uh, was government or parastatal plantations, uh, was poorly managed, and so there's less wood available, le less okay, pine great. available. So what we've been looking into, uh, as um, Conrad mentioned, is that we've been looking into uh, we've we've tested all sorts of local woods um, in the hopes that there would be better forestry management developing for, for indigenous forests, for, for, for the, the old forests, <coughs> and hoping that we could do um, offcuts from that. Um, and also we have also uh, done a pilot of planting um, nitrogen fixating uh, trees with, uh, at farmers uh, so that they could regenerate some land and, and we could get the, 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 the cut. Cuts, cuttings from, from those trees. That's what we've been looking into for now. Okay, thank you, Marion. I think it's time now to move to our next speaker. Um, please unshare your screen, Marion. And the next speaker is, is uh, Kitaki Kokil from India. Uh, Kitaki, you're manager of the company EcoSense, which is producing cook stoves, uh, gasifying cook yeah. stoves. And yes. uh, you have also initiated some village level uh, pelletizing projects. Can you explain a little bit about your company, about your products and also about these 
project. Sure. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Uh, is it is it visible? Is it vis it's visible? It's fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so to begin with, uh, let me just talk a bit about uh, what EcoSense is about. So EcoSense, uh, are, so we at EcoSense basically are committed to providing energy efficient cooking products, uh, which are basically a uh, forced draft uh, biomass cook stove. Uh, the, the fuel that we use are focused on our uh, pallets, biomass pallets. And uh, basically what we have been doing since the past few years is focusing on developing the best of its kind biomass cook stores. And during our uh, time working in the field uh, in India, what we realized is uh, we don't have a proper uh, channel set for uh, pallet uh, distribution at all the remote villages. And this kind of created an issue when uh, the sustainable use of uh, biomass cook store came into picture. Uh, whenever we used to distribute any cook stove in the field, uh, we used to we usually go back after six months or probably a year just to check if they are using. And we always found them using uh, firewood or just leaves uh, as fuel. And the basic reason for that was unavailability of pallets in their local market. And kind of that is what uh, triggered us to probably work on a solution where uh, pallets could be manufactured at uh, village level. So just to talk a bit about the scenario, as we all know, is one third of the population still uses organic materials, wood, cow dung, charcoal, to uh, cook food or just heat their house or, or just light the indoor space. Uh, as we know, the current, uh, uh, scenario is uh, definitely has a huge impact on the health, on a few gender biased violences, and even environmental uh, impact. Uh, so basically, whenever we talk about pallets, uh, a, a short uh, kind of introduction when we say is basically when you kind of you know place uh, biomass, the powder of the biomass in under high pressure, and it forms into uh, cylindrical uh, structure, as you can see in the picture. Uh, that is what biomass uh, pallets are called. And uh, biomass pallets are generally superior when we compare them to you know, feedstock uh, because they're denser, they burn properly in a cook stove. And with the use of uh, these biomass pallets, what we have observed is you get absolutely uh, no smoke while cooking. They're much more cleaner. Uh, the, they burn completely and less than 1% of ash remains once they burn uh, completely in the cook stove. Uh, so just to have a brief scenario of uh, biomass availability in India, as you can see the agri residue uh, is majoritively in the states of Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, uh, and you know Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan. And rest is the forest or the wasteland, as you can see. So what we have done is we have kind of tried to focus in the state of Maharashtra, uh, Madhya Pradesh, and uh, Gujarat as our, uh, you know, uh, kind of field in which we would be working. And keeping that into picture, we have uh, kind of, you know, established uh, our work in this state. Uh, when we talk about biomass as a cooking uh, fuel, we usually uh, kind of go to firewood, the solid firewood, which generally, you know, it takes four to five hours per day to actually source. And when we uh, go to remote villages, it is, uh, of course, it takes more than five hours to actually go and source wood to cook food for four to five people. Then uh, another type in which currently people are using is the forest residue, which is just uh, leaves or branches which are uh, cut down or just uh, are waste. Uh, leaf litter, so leaf litter is basically just dry leaves which are found in uh, our gardens or neighboring areas. Uh, fruits, which basically all these uh, have very low density and are not suitable to cook food. But due to unavailability of any structured fuel in India, people are uh, obviously using all these uh, biomasses. 
people sometimes also use agricultural residue so when we say agricultural residue for example corn cobs or just you know rice husk or any any sort of agricultural residue that they generate from their fields they are they're getting it back to their home and burning it uh, in the their traditional cook stove which is actually not helping them at all uh so what we did was we kind of studied all these biomass which are found majoritively in india and created uh, 20 to 30 recipes out of it and when i say recipes i mean is we kind of use for example when we say groundnut shells so we use the groundnut shells we put them through a shredder machine use the powder that was found and tried and make made make pallets out of them and burn them in a gasifier stove and we then went back and forth to check what will be the best efficiency that we get out of these groundnut shells if any other uh, biomass material is required with a combination of these groundnut shells to make it much more efficient and uh, as of now we have almost 30 recipes with uh, biomass some are mixed with other sawdust or other uh, uh, wood waste but uh, all these recipes are tested all these recipes can be burned in a gasifier stove and almost all of them have an efficiency of 40 and above uh, so when uh, we talk about village level production of biomass pallets uh, what it does is uh, it reduces the cost of pallets that needs to be transported from one end to the uh, local village end uh, because in india even if you have to pay uh, 5 rupees more than what you have to pay for your current uh, fuel uh, people don't uh, pay that price so we there was a paramount need to reduce uh, the cost of the pallets for our end customers and one of the major uh, criteria or one of the major uh, kind of contributor was the transportation cost of these pallets. So that is absolutely reduced down when you get the pallet manufacturing at the village level. And what it did was it kind of made the biomass pallets readily available for the end customers throughout the day. Usually what used to happen is the transportation a uh, truck used to reach the local or remote village once a week twice a week due to you know lack of distribution channel and uh, with unavailability of biomass pallets people uh, you know invariably shifted to their traditional uh, cook stove which was not acceptable to us so kind of it says that getting uh, you know solution was to just establish this unit and we did that uh, basically, it had three uh, different uh, variations to that uh, production unit. One was to locally find raw material, which could be turned into uh, biomass pallets, which could then be uh, used as fuel for the improved cook stoves. So what we did was in the village that we selected, which was in Gujarat called Kalsar, uh, there, there is a particular uh, tree called babul tree. So what it was doing in that specific region was actually it was sucking the water from the ground and it, it kind of uh, created some sort of a drought in that specific region uh, with a lack of water and it was just the rapid growth of these babul trees was creating an issue for the villagers. So we uh, took that as our uh, raw material we used our shredder machine to kind of shred these branches of the bubble tree into powder and used our pallet machine to develop pallets out of these uh, bubble tree so what happened is we took a problem which the villagers was facing with these bubble tree and converted them into useful pallets which would then be born into the uh, biomass cook stove uh, so the key points I wanted to highlight was, uh, as, as I did explain, the bubble tree, which was largely found in the forest near Kalsar, uh, to take from the forest to the production unit, uh, we did that. Then we established a pallet machine and a shredder machine at a local NGO office. Uh, 
uh, then we uh, conducted various trials to uh, have a, a perfect uh, pallet recipe out of it. Then from the local uh, NGO office, we established a transportation chain to the local market, which was around a kilometer away. Uh, and now what has happened is in that village, uh, as you can see, uh, the shredder machine is being run actually by uh, the local people who want to work, who want to earn uh, livelihood. So um, basically, uh, the kind of bubble tree branches that they are uh, sourcing locally from the forest, they usually have one ton of bubble tree branches that they uh, get in the production unit daily. Then the, they check the moisture content, which is around 35%. And uh, then uh, kind of they dry it out as uh, just, you know, in the sun, uh, there is no drying machine available. They just put it out in the sun. And uh, basically the way the, these branches from, if, if, if 100 kg of bubble uh, tree powder uh, is generated is gotten from the shredder then it converts to 70 uh, kg of pallets which has which have around 10 to 12 uh, moisture content uh, we did extensive training uh, with the people we made we made them understand how to use the machine how to maintain the machine how to kind of if the machine breaks down due to some reason how to kind of uh, maintain it you know, get it to work again. And uh, the capacity uh, is around 90 to 100 kg per hour is the output uh, of the shredder machine. And uh, the output of the pallet machine is ar around similar 80 to 100 kg per hour. And right now the, the plant is running for uh, 10 hours per day. And Two manpower is required. One is to run the pallet machine and one is to just pack the final pallets and get it to the local market. Uh, as uh, I just wanted to kind of summarize uh, the production unit, which is at Kalsar village. Uh, basically, uh, the activities, as you can see, are three major activities. One is collection of the bubble branches from the forest. Uh, one manpower and vehicle to transport is required approximately one ton of raw material they usually collect, uh, converting those branches into powder form with the help of shredder machine. Uh, then third is converting those, that powder into uh, pallets, usable pallets, uh, and which is 80 kg per hour is right now uh, the capacity at which the unit is running. Uh, just to say an impact or you know the total capacity, uh, we are right now producing 800 uh, kg per day and uh, shipping it off to the local market of the Kalsar village. And uh, usually they do have uh, on, a, on any given day, a 200 kg pallets are there in the store for our end customers to just go as you would probably go buy vegetables or fruits, you, they go buy pallets from the market. Uh, we have tried to make it as simple as possible. And we're right now in that specific village, we have distributed 500 uh, cook stoves and we would we have plans to uh, kind of uh, triple the number in the coming months. And we uh, are supplying basically two tons of pallets for the villagers. Uh, as I said, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the pallets uh, re do require another component to be added to make it more efficient. But uh, considering the bubble tree, we, we did not, uh, um, I mean, we didn't add any anything, which is pure biomass, which was sourced locally. And we conducted trials out of it. And the burn time we uh, got was 55 minutes. Uh, the ash content is less than 1%. Efficiency of the stove with the bubble tree pallets is 42. And the flame temperature is around 800 to 900. And uh, another added advantage of the bubble tree, what we got was the rotula, which was a very staple food of that region. It's a thick bread that uh, the local people eat every day and, and can't stay without it. Cooks perfectly on the stove. 
and kind of that made it more acceptable. Uh, uh, just to take it uh, a bit ahead, what we have done is uh, we call it a self-sufficient energy village, which has three branches. One is, uh, of course, reducing indoor air pollution, sustainable supply of structured fuel, which is the pallets, and distribution of uh, improved cook stove, which are forced draft uh, biomass cook stoves. And our target is to just focus the entire solution around women. And currently, uh, I would like to share with everyone is we're, we're training few women uh, to run the uh, pallet uh, production unit on their own. So probably in another six months or so, they would be completely running the entire unit, uh, just women and with no help of anyone else. So we really want to just focus on them, keeping them in the center and building an ecosystem around them. Uh, so uh, our uh, targets or our impact, which we would uh, measure our work uh, is through how many village level entrepreneurs we've developed through this uh, concept, creating more jobs for women in the clean cooking sector uh, at their local village level. Uh, in this specific village, we, uh, aim to have an impact on 50,000 people. Uh, obviously, uh, work a bit more on reducing the cost of the pallets and just ready and easy accessibility of uh, pallets fuel for improved uh, cook stoves. Uh, the next step further going on would be a continuous pallet uh, manufacturing. So you would re only require one person to run an entire uh, unit of pallet manufacturing and it will be a continuous uh, production. So that is our next uh, step regarding uh, village level uh, pallet manufacturing. Um, so yeah, uh, that is uh, all from my side. Thank you very much, Kitaki. That was extremely interesting and quite amazing what you have been achieving in India uh, by promoting local uh, pellet production in villages. Um, one thing that I, I noticed was, or what I didn't quite understand is, uh, you mentioned that the, the, the branches of the tree that come go into the process have 35% of humidity. Um, how do you dry the stuff down to 12%? Out, out in the open. I mean, it takes a long time, but uh, it, for them, it, 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 it is not possible to buy or dry or uh, so we just kind of put it, uh, and, and in India, in Gujarat, the temperatures are so high in summers that it kind of uh, dries it uh, in a day or two max. But yeah, that is an extra process that we have to do, drying it out in the open. But you're drying it before you're crushing it or after? Uh, both, both times, both times we have to do it, yeah. So the powder will it, also be spread out to dry? Yeah, yes, okay. yes. Right. Um, there was another question on the low ash content. Uh, it's only 1% ash. Um, yeah. uh, that is due to the fact that it is woody biomass, correct? Because agricultural biomass would have more ash. Yeah. Yes, yes, true. And also because our stores are a forced draft, so it has pan, so we have better control of air uh, to fuel ratio. Uh, that is also one of the reasons to have low ash content. Uh, I also see a question whether the villages are actually able to afford to buy the stoves or are they, uh, do they need to take up a credit to buy the stoves? Can you comment on that? Uh, so basically the way we kind of have of the financial model is it's like, uh, you know, pay as you go. So you don't pay the entire amount in one go. You pay it on, on a monthly installment basis. So uh, it is uh, affordable to them. them. They don't have to pay the entire amount in one go. It's like per month, they pay a certain amount. Uh, there is a question also on the gender aspect, um, mentioning that men typically would decide uh, regarding investments, while the woman would benefit from the investments. How, true, how do you true. manage to solve that issue? Uh, so yeah, that is one of the major issues because uh, they obviously don't feel the need to have another uh, appliance in the house to cook food. 
for, but what we have done is we have uh, kind of conducted few uh, focused groups awareness session just with uh, men and uh, kind of uh, cooking in front of them, making them uh, understand how the product is being used, uh, making them actually try and cook on the stove and you know just uh, isolating them in a way in a focused way and just talking to them and uh, making them aware as well as we we went and spoke to uh, schools we conducted awareness sessions in schools for the uh, kids so that they go home and talk to their parents and make them aware about uh, the the you know the kind of positive points of improved cook stove but yes we do have a long road ahead of us uh, fascinating. Okay, Taki, can you give me an idea how many of uh, these advanced cook stoves have you sold in India? How many are in operation now? Uh, I mean, a lot. We, we actually, uh, I mean, it's uh, around uh, maybe 600 or so a month, but of course it keeps on uh, changing. Yes, that so it is would be like yeah. uh, 10,000 in, in a year or something like that. Yeah, but I mean, again, it's it's also about the sustainable use of those stove. So if, if someone has bought a year ago, we have to go and check with each customer if they're still using after a year, which uh, at this stage is not possible for us to do. But yeah, uh, on an average. And what would be the typical obstacle of keeping using it? Um, availability of pallets, uh, major. Because whenever we have gone back and asked them, why are you not using the stove? One of the major reasons is pallets are not available. I mean, uh, if today they're available, next month they might not be. And uh, yeah, that is one of the major uh, hurdles. And uh, a lot of people in India are actually trying to improve the distribution channel of pallets with uh, many big uh, pallet manufacturing units being uh, installed at a city or regional level and then the distribution channel being developed for uh, villages. But yes, hopefully this will improve and we get sustainable use of stores in India. Thank you, Kataki. That was extremely interesting. Uh, one Thank very you, last Mr. question before we uh, head on to the next speaker. Have you ever considered carbon finance to support your project? Yes, we are in, in, in the middle of uh, probably implementing two projects this year, carbon finance uh, projects. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Thank by, you. Uh, uh, so let me just mention that we have a working group on advanced biomass cooking in the World Bioenergy Association. And the issue of carbon credits is, is the one issue we are currently working on most intensively because that could really change uh, the, the economics very much for the users of such uh, advanced cook stoves. So with, uh, with this, I'm going to uh, head on uh, back to Africa, in fact, and uh, the, I'll, I'll give the floor to Chris Fodor, who has been uh, building a pellet plant in Gabon. Chris, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Fodor. These are some of our African pellets. Can you hear me? Is everything okay technologically? Technically, yes. Okay, fantastic. I'll share the screen soon as, as soon as I finish introducing myself. So uh, as you can tell from my accent, I'm American, but I'm based in Salzburg. And uh, the anecdote is I was going to retire about three years ago, but um, I fell in love with my pellet stove uh, south of Salzburg in our country house. And I decided I would explore the market potential for wood pellets in Central Africa, more specifically in Gabon. And that's what I will be talking to you today about. And now let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen, Christian? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so you can see my screen and you can hear me. So technology is with us. Um, you can see my name. You'll see two companies mentioned there. The holding is the Congo Basin Pellets here in Austria, but the operating company is based in Gabon. Gabon, as you probably know, is in Central Africa between Cameroon and Angola. Um, this is a short history of the company, Congo Basin Pellets. 
in 2019, when I was um, finishing uh, my project for the Austrian Development Agency on fish farming, I decided I would do one last project before retiring. And I decided that I would look into something related to wood. So in 2019, I did the market analysis and I also overviewed all the pellet making equipment and very quickly decided that I could not afford European equipment. Although I must admit, I didn't know about refurbished equipment at that point. And at the uh, end of 2019, I made a trip to China to look at six different manufacturers of equipment. In 2020, a year known for the Wuhan bat uh, pandemic, uh, my extruders arrived late in June and I wanted to check that they did function because everybody in Austria to a penny told me, Chris, do not buy Chinese equipment but I couldn't afford European equipment, so I had to go with that. The extruders arrived in June and we basically did a small test on them. We didn't produce pellets, but we wanted to make sure the machines function properly. And in September, an angel investor called Hans joined me in my adventure. Um, he's of Danish origin, but lives in Salzburg. And that was very important because it gave me financial insurance since I didn't want to deplete my retirement funds all too much. In 2021, in February, with the long shipping delays, the remainder of the machinery arrived in Gabon. Um, we'll go into some of that a bit later. And in March, we discovered that the veneer waste that we had a lot of in the Encoq Special Economic Zone, where we're located, couldn't be handled by the grinders or the chippers that we had. And so here I, I am the sounding board to what Conrad said. Um, we developed some of our own machinery. We had mechanics, welders, electricians, and we very quickly developed a machine that is not perfect, but it functions. In April of 2021, we produced our first pellets and we had them tested. And then uh, by September, we finished the commissioning the factory. Um, in all, although I don't show the financials for that, uh, know that the factory setup cost us approximately 20 to 30,000 euros. In September, we had our first production director join us, and he was a catastrophe. Um, and the second production director joined us in December, and things are working quite well with him uh, in the sense that in January of this year, we had good production results with eight millimeter ring dies. And this is an important little anecdote. Um, we actually initially only purchased ring dies of six millimeter diameter. And they work as well, but the eight millimeter ring dies work better. And the only reason we had a ring die is that the Chinese made a mistake. In our last minute order of a third extruder, they put in an eight millimeter ring die instead of a six millimeter one. And so we were able to test that. And so the situation now is that we're currently um, ordering a new set of ring dies, um, eight millimeters to, to, so that all three of our extruders can function on eight millimeters. And also, and I'll go into that a bit later, we're considering a production line for briquettes. So that's the short synopsis. The thing I'm most proud about is that uh, I think I can claim, or we can claim that we're the first to ever have produced pellets from wood in Central Africa. Um, the only other pellet plants that I'm aware of in Africa, but I do not have full knowledge use other types of wood and not uh, the tropical hardwoods or the softwood okume that we have. Our waste is, um, our waste comes from the special economic zone where there are about 50 companies set up that transform wood. They make planks, they make uh, terrace decking, they make a lot of veneer, which is what you see on the cover of Camembert boxes. It's a very thin or for plywood, that's what's used. And so within, within our uh, circumference about three kilometers within the special economic zone. There's a lot of okume, which is a softwood, but then there are hardwoods such as azobe, paduk, and belinga. Azobe, the anecdote is that is the wood that was used for railroad ties for a very, very long time worldwide. It's one of the hardest and most uh, moisture resistant woods in the world. We found out that our ideal recipe for pellets is about 50% okume and 50% a hardwood which could be a mixture. And as I said, we have a preference for the eight millimeter diameter. The very nice thing, and this was tested by um, Martin English's laboratory in Vienna, the BEA Institute, is that we have 10% more energy 
than a normal pellet from, uh, let's say, Europe or North America or Russia. So this is proof that black pellets matter. Um, we are EN plus quality, A1, and this enables us to actually start exporting by container, which is what we plan to do instead of just shipping bulk industrial pellets. And we have applied also for SBP certification. And lastly, we have a, an excellent carbon footprint. I should actually change that to good. In Gabon, our footprint is very good in terms of carbon because all our wood waste comes from within a three kilometer radius. But it's true that do we do need to, if we export to Europe, which is our plan, we do need to have the ship travel, which is about the same as the, sh the travel time is the same as from the South uh, US coast, about 15, 16 days. So what is our current situation? Um, there have been bumps in the road and there certainly are risks ahead. Africa is definitely not an easy continent to work in. Um, and yet it's not the first time that I worked in Africa. In fact, I started there as a transportation planner when I was 20. So I thought I knew uh, enough about Africa. What we've achieved, as I said, we produced the first Central African wood pellets. Um, we developed local means to manufacture simple, inexpensive, but short-lived machines. Um, this again, I bounce off what Conrad said before. Um, given the shipping chaos and given the expense of machinery from, let's say, the Northern Hemisphere, some of the machines we decide to produce locally, conveyor belts, um, we're now producing impellers, which are like big vacuum cleaners for our material movements, um, which get rid of the need for conveyor belts. And uh, here I'm bouncing off what Ketaki said, we're trying to employ mostly women, um, namely single mothers. Unfortunately, there are not very many women electricians or welders um, or mechanics. So <laughs> we're a little bit limited on that front. So what remains to be done at this point is we're acquiring more eight millimeter ring dies so that all three of our extruders can produce on at least a 10 hour per day shift, but we're hoping to go to 16 hours. Once we have those ring dies, we expect to stabilize production at higher um, levels and longer production volume, well, higher volumes, longer production times, I should say. Our plant is designed for 30,000 tons per year, but beware, um, the Chinese will tell you a certain rating for capacity and often the rating is below that. So up to now, maybe because of our wood species, we have not been able to run the machines at two to two and a half tons per hour, which is what, we're, what we were promised. We're able to go up to about 700 to 800 kilograms per hour. So we're at about one third of the rated capacity, which means that we might buy more extruders. And here for the economists in the room, the, the trade-off is cheap in China, but not as productive or more expensive in Europe, but more productive and more reliable. So that's, everybody has to make their decision on that. What remains to be done also is we're introducing a production line for briquettes, and I'll get into that in the second part of this presentation. We're considering opening a second plant in Port Gentil. We're now, Port Gentil is the, another town in Gabon. It's on the harbor. Uh, and we, um, uh, we also are thinking of opening a briquette production in the hinterland, um, about 600 or 700 kilometers inland, because as you'll see, and we'll go into that later, the capital expenditure, therefore the risk is much lower. What we're also considering later for 2024 is uh, delivering biomass for two thermal power plants that currently use diesel, but that are located on a river where we could flow the biomass down to them and they could therefore transfer from diesel to wooden biomass. Now, someone previously had asked about the costs, and I think Martin had given a, a reply. Um, I jokingly say this is for your eyes only. Uh, these are, it's related to every plant is different. But just so you know, what we pay for our raw materials is only the transportation cost inbound. So it's about 10 euros, 65 cents. The energy is about 750 per, these are all euros per ton. Labor is 1065 per ton. The rental of the hangar is about 135. The depreciation, uh, depreciation on the equipment was about, is about three euros and 35 cents. Our capex on equipment was about half a million euros. The outbound transport to the harbor is about 6.5. The harbor charge is outrageous in Gabon. 
about 25 euros per ton, which means that your total per ton without the sea freight were at about 65 euros per ton. Now, my recommendation for African pellet dreamers, I have five things, um, some of which have been touched upon before. But the first thing is you should start by assessing your demand properly. Um, I've been in discussions with a couple of other people in Africa who are interested in uh, developing pellets or briquettes. And oftentimes the demand picture was not clear at first. And if I can contradict Martin or, or open up a discussion with him here, the supply is important, but the demand is more important. If you can't sell what you're producing, you're not gonna make it. So the first step is assess your demand. That could be for export or it could be for cook stoves or it could be, as I was mentioning, for thermal plants locally. That's something you have to do your field work on that before you decide what you wanna invest in. Um, my second point is I would say, do not hesitate to invest in thorough field research on your exact biomass, your wood waste or your agri waste. What are your sources? What, is the, the humid, what are the humidity levels? And sorry, I can't see my own screen here. There was something else, sorry. And also, um, you know, if you're using different wood species or different agricultural species, for example, someone in Uganda that I've been talking to, it's a mixture of sugarcane bagasse and sometimes rice husks, that has an important impact. So you need to do your homework on the chemical or the physical characteristics of those wood wastes. The third thing I would recommend is um, if you have doubts, consider investing in shipping some sawdust to Europe for some preliminary pelletizing tests. We didn't do this, but now with hindsight, it's something I think I would do um, because our wood types were very different from the wood types that have been seen before. My fourth recommendation, think small to start. Instead of ordering jumbo size like I did, so learn from my mistakes, we got a hammer mill that can handle five tons an hour. It's a catastrophe. We've gone through two sets of ball bearings now and the thing keeps on giving us problems. What we should have done is ordered a smaller hammer mill or two smaller hammer mills and used those as backups in case one broke down. The same thing with the drum dryer. We ordered a very big drum dryer because that's what the, the equipment manufacturer recommended. We then left it standing on the side of the shed where we operate and we built a smaller one locally that we can manage more easily. Here again, my last point is, and I bounce on what Conrad said, um, manufacture what you can locally. You need to find good staff in terms of welders, electricians, mechanics, and get your hands dirty as well. Now, my second part, I realize I'm going uh, way over my time. I'm sorry about this. Um, my second part is on briquettes. There are only three slides, so this should take me another five minutes. Why do I think briquettes might hold a better alternative for us? First of all, what you see here is a, a very rough sketch of what a screw extruder briquette looks like. And basically your material comes on top and then it's fed via a screw, it's compressed into this nose, and then it comes out. Here you have some heating elements, so that compresses and heats your briquettes. So it's basically almost the same principle as a, as a pelletizing, but it's a much simpler machine. machine. Therefore, what you have here is, um, sorry, let me look here. You have a simpler technology that might be better adapted to emerging market conditions. And Christian, I would, uh, I, Christian, I would invite, I would suggest you invite me in a year's time and I'll tell you about our experience on this. It has lower maintenance costs and a much simpler spare parts list. It has more flexibility on the input humidity levels especially if you're producing for local users who do not require EN plus standards. So if this is for cook stoves, who cares if your humidity level of your briquettes coming out is 9% or 11% as opposed to the five to I think 10% required by EN plus. There's also more flexibility on the input recipes and less rigor on the component proportions. If you go visit a pellet plant in Europe you will see their input material is pretty much homogenous. I mean, it's the pine, it's the birch, it's the, you know, within the right proportions, right communities. In Africa, that doesn't exist as far as I know. We get a mess of things coming in and we have to be able to deal with that. 
And that makes it difficult, which is why also if you have more flexibility on your input raw material, you also have more flexibility or more um, reliability on the output side. The next point is you're less sensitive to irregular power supply. If you have a, a pellet press and your power goes off, which fortunately does not happen in Gabon that much, we're very fortunate there. But if your power supply goes off and your ring die is full, you've got a problem because your ring die might, if the wood is in there for too long, it gets stuck. And believe you me, it is not easy to unblock a ring die because you have something like 750 holes that you have to drill out. So good luck, my friend. And the last point in the adventure of briquettes is it's easier to commission, to set up in your factory. Um, it's almost through. This is a chart that compares um, pellet versus briquette making. Um, very briefly, as a lot of this I mentioned, the first column in, in, let's say, brown is on pellets, the second in blue is on briquettes. The technology for pellets is basically uh, ring dies and rollers, whereas, as we saw in the sketch for briquettes, it's direct compression, which is either mechanical or a screw extruder. Equipment costs, someone had asked about this earlier. These are only indicative numbers. Please don't quote me on these because I don't have all the updated figures. But basically, a pellet, just the pellet mill, mill in Europe or in the US, as far as, as I know, costs about 300,000 euros. In China, it's about 50,000 euros. For briquettes, in uh, briquette press in Europe or the USA is, let's say, 50,000 euros, more or less. In China, it's about 5,000 euros. In terms of energy use, which is important for countries where your power supply is not so regular, you're at about 125 kilowatts for pellets and about 25 kilowatts for briquette press. But your capacity is lower. For pellets, here I was going on the basis of about two tons an hour, whereas for briquettes, it's more like 300 to 900 kilos an hour. My last chart, and this I'll go over very quickly because we covered this. This is just sort of what we're planning in the future. And just so you know, we are uh, backing up our pellet mills with briquettes. And we're considering after our tests of briquettes using that more generally for rollout in Gabon and perhaps also in other neighboring countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, a very interesting insight and also something to think about uh, when we're talking about pellet production uh, in, in how far uh, a briquette production would be uh, an alternative. Um, a lot of specific questions to you. I think it was quite comprehensive what you were telling us. So we'll move on to Magnus Stahl. And uh, he will tell us about uh, what you have mentioned, basically, Chris, and that is different materials uh, uh, need different types of uh, pelletizing technology. And uh, Magnus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christian, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. Hello, everyone. My name is Magnus Stål, and I am an associate professor at Environmental and Energy System at Karlstad University in Sweden. I will try to say what we can do and what we can contribute to in, in this uh, pelletizing in, uh, in developing countries. And uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, where we are situated, the research we've done and what we can do with new materials. Um, we're situated in Karlstad, Sweden. It's actually right between Stockholm and Oslo, if you, if you know the capitals of Sweden and Norway. And in our country, there are a lot of woods, a lot of uh, paper mills, uh, pellet mills and saw mills. So that we as a university focus on research on, on drying wood, drying uh, sawdust and uh, doing pellets. It's uh, uh, quite clear that we could cooperate with the companies uh, nearby. And uh, uh, we work in, a, in an environment, it's called Pro to be if you search online. And it's basically a research on processes and products for a forest-based circular bioeconomy. And uh, it's not just that we in new that that is new development and processing for pellet technology work as a group or of our own. We do we do do research within Prove to be where we know 
things about drying and the watering of both paper and and uh, logs and sawdust. Uh, we also have functional surfaces, water energy nexus, sustainable development research, and so on. But today I will focus on uh, on the on, on the pelleting, and our research comprises how renewable materials can become a high quality pellet product in a sustainable way, of course, and as energy efficient as possible. We have done research on uh, drying of sawdust and biomaterials since uh, the late 1980s and the research on uh, on pellets and uh, mainly forest based pellets since the uh, beginning of 2000. So for 20 years and uh, the focus of the research we do, it started out with testing new materials and broadened the, the biomass base, and but but focused on pine and uh, and spruce as we are in Sweden, and the quality aspects of producing pellets, but also to see the effect of bio bio based additives when needed, uh, when you start to mix materials and uh, or getting materials with high uh, moisture content or, and such, there might be a need for additives. Uh, we are also in, uh, we have seen, I see both Martin and uh, Conrad and, and uh, Marion talked about uh, all the fire on, and the risk with pelleting. Uh, we have, we are doing research together with um, SLU in, in Umeå on self-heating and off-gassing during storage and of course on energy efficiency. But where we are unique, uh, that are that we are studying the effect of different wood substances. And uh, what do I mean by that? Well, it's not only that if you produce from softwood or hardwood, of course, you get different kind of pellets with different qualities and they behave differently when produced in the pellet machine. But also there is a great rare variety in different parts of the softwood or hardwood or any biomass you have. Um, uh, in woods there are hardwood and softwood, but there are top and branches that you have mentioned mentioned before. And of course they get different amount of ashes when produced and they have different uh, calorific value, etc, etc. But we have looked into that and we are uh, also looking into how is the material uh, built like a biomass, whatever. They have lignin and cellulose, hemicellulose, they have proteins, extractives, and so on. And we have actually been doing research also to see what are those substances doing uh, for the pelletation and, and to try to understand why the pellet holds together. Is it the lignin that you said, like 15? 20 years ago, or is it actually the hemicellulose or other uh, substances in the woods or biomasses that are responsible for, example, hardness of pellets that you see the, the graphic or the figure down right. You can see that we have a control which is pure pine and pure beech, and what happens if we put in some more cellulose or, or, or starch wheat or pectin or lignin, you can see that it affects the hardness of, of the pellets. Of course, this is very uh, theoretical and practical and we do tests on small quantities, but we learn a lot on what, what, what the pelleting is, not only in form of quality, but also how how different materials behave inside the pelleting machine. I will soon come to developing countries also. Uh, ongoing uh, external research projects where we have a lot of funding right now is uh, two projects together with the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences in Umeå, together with us, Karlstad University, where we look at safe and well characterized raw materials and products. And, uh, with new process customization with the help of spectroscopic methods, for example, and to control the sawdust maturation at pelleting. Also, I have the inner pellets with increased resource efficiency through innovative new raw material handling, and it's of course in the production of fuel pellets. But we also have life cycle optimized process of value creation of wood materials because we 
we are in a subject with environmental and energy systems. And of course, we, we are then good at doing system analysis, as you have already mentioned in what uh, where are we when we do produce pellets and and what are we producing pellets from what material is it agriculture waste is it wood waste what is in the surrounding how long are the transportation uh, uh, what is transportation cost and so on and how does it affect the life cycle analysis of the, of the chosen raw materials um, and we have also been in a project with uh, enriched biochar from forest industry residues and that is to take the nutrients back to the forest so we can close the loop uh, on taking out forest for paper and uh, sawmills and, uh, and pulp mills and uh, using uh, the sludge bark and ash pelletizate and uh, may have it uh, use it as fertilizers in the forest. Internally, in, in our research group, we work with trying to understand the pelletizing process, both for the pure substances within the woods, but also between different woods and different biomass materials to try to understand exactly what happened just uh, mechanically, chemically, and so on. And most of our research is done in single pellet presses where you produce it one pellet at a time. I will come back to that. And we have also looked into new raw materials and also uh, how to test different cooking stoves. Uh, and we have done that together with the Merchant Cooking Solution with Marion and Matthias, for example. Uh, we can do tests uh, in three different scales. So we're not only doing this uh, single pellet presses where we do one pellet at a time, we learn a lot from that. We can see what happens inside the dye and we can learn about the compression phase and so on. But we can also go up to this a little bit bigger machine where you produce 10 to 20 kilo an hour and you can see what parameters you can change and what happens when you mix materials and so on to see what is the optimal moisture content, etc. But we also have a pilot scale. Uh, like you like you it's producing about two three hundred kilo an hours and uh, here we can see the effects if we try to scale up the uh, the production and uh, give results back to the industry and uh, here we can also do tests on exa example the energy efficiency of uh, using different materials and so on uh, but why do we use single pellet presses? Well, we try to understand what happens inside the dye. And when you're doing, when you do production continuously in a big machine, you have this compression phase. You have the flow into the the actual uh, hole, and then you have the compression uh, through the hole. And to try to see and understand what happened in those three phases, and to calculate the energy used with different materials on those phases, we need three different machines uh, to, to study those phenomena on, on the compression, on the flow energy to get the material into the hole and, and the friction energy and that we can give back to you when we test different materials. But we have been involved in uh, in Zambia, and I think Marion and, and Conrad maybe recognize those pictures because this is the old factory. Me and, and my professor Jonas, we um, visited Zambia in 2017. And as you have all talked about already, there are logistics done by muscle power uh, in small, when, when they use sawdust, for example, and you can see the blending process and the cooling process in the old factory. So I congratulate you to the new factory uh, where you have solved a lot of problems from five years ago. So congratulations to you. But we have seen it firsthand and we have, oh, yeah. and we have also tested different kinds of materials from Zambia to be used to replace charcoal in, in the stoves. And now they have a new stove that's even more efficient. And 
here are some of the materials that had been sent to us in, in Karlstad. Uh, for the small scale testing, we need 50 or maybe 100 grams per material to do tests on uh, are they suitable for pelletation, what is the optimal uh, moisture content, how should the recipe be if you blend soft wood uh, with hard wood or if you have se seed capsules that are rather hard to pelletize or peanut shells. Could you mix that with pine or pigeon pea or what is the best solution for, for your pelleting? And we also have seen firsthand what you already talked about. Uh, the problems to handle is to build factories with good infrastructure with the various raw materials, sometimes uneven electricity supply. So we need knowledge, we need experience, and uh, we would like more domestic data, of course, to do a for example, LCA analysis and system analysis to see what the best solution is for each case. Uh, we are university, so we need funding to do research, but we also have master thesis and students uh, that are doing master and bachelor thesis. And here are some of them that have been involved with emerging cooking solutions from 2017 to 2022. We, they have looked at evaluation of different hardwood species from Zambia to produce pellets. And one have looked at the potential biomass from Zambia for production of fuel pellets in a single pellet press, uh, looking into the friction and compression and, uh, and uh, to see the hardness of the pellets and the moisture uptake afterwards and that had transported and that have been worked up to uh, scientific paper that can be downloaded we also had simon anderson that worked in zambia at the pellet factory for a year and he looked at production of sickle bus pig and pea and pine etc uh, so those master theses uh, they are they are working with the subject uh, for for half a year and they can do really good uh, uh, studies on specific uh, materials or or to evaluate uh, different stoves etc and if you go into diva portal on the the link here you can search for those uh, master thesis if you like more information uh, but what information have they what have they come up to? Well, we can present this in, in various ways. We can present, uh, of course, what type of material was used, what was the best moisture content, what is the durability and hardness of the pellets, the, the pure quality of the material. But we can also evaluate the, the pelletizing process. Uh, what is the best pressure, what is the pressure to use, temperatures, how is the friction? How big is the friction work and and, uh, and compression work in the die? And here you see, for example, a graph that shows the friction work for different materials. Where bamboo, for example, has a high friction work, and pine a bit less. And on the bottom scale here is cassava. So this kind of results can be evolved from from the research and from from the student works and uh, then we can conclude what materials are suitable to mix and also if it should be 20 percent of one and 80 percent of the other or what recipe is the best to conclude uh, we would really much like collaboration with you of course uh, the best thing would be, of course, to apply for research funding together to finance testing, PhD students and the research work in general. But we could also together create interesting projects for master and bachelor thesis here at Costa University. So you can contact us at, at NewDEP. Uh, and we would like to be there to increase the knowledge on pelleting in developing countries. And that is raw material studies, studies of the actual pelleting process chosen but also LCA and system analysis. We have one research at, at us that have done an LCA, for example, of uh, cook stoves in, in Vietnam. So we have that knowledge as well. And how could we cooperate? Well, materials could be sent to us. Uh, we can do studies on single pellet press level, or we can scale it up depending on the material we get. 
We can look at material properties, moisture content, the pelletability, but we can also do tests of cooking stoves according to standards. And hopefully we can give recommendations back to you to, for manufacturing on site. And my contacts uh, are below. Thank you very much. I'm open for questions. Thank you, Magnus. That was uh, a very comprehensive uh, show of the different activities that are uh, conducted in your university. And I guess the invitation uh, is up there for uh, pellet pro pelleting projects to contact you. I think this was also something that Chris Foda was suggesting look at the pelleting uh, uh, properties of your material before you order the machines. And I, I, I guess that's the idea. Uh, uh, spend more uh, in research in the beginning and less than on, uh, uh, on um, equipment that doesn't work afterwards. I think that's, that's the idea. Thank you very much for this contribution. And I guess everybody who has more specific questions can directly uh, address you with the uh, contacts that you're publishing here. And we will obviously also uh, uh, put this webinar online so you can uh, look at it uh, later if, if, if you have uh, an interest in specific details. Now, yeah, thank let's you. continue with our last speaker. Uh, Oscar Espinosa Mijares is uh, located in Mexico and he is uh, he has opened one of the first pelleting plants in Mexico. O Oscar, please tell us about your experiences. Yes, of course, Christian. Thanks uh, very much for the invitation and for the World Bioenergy Association and yourself for having me here. I'll briefly go through our experience uh, in Mexico. Um, and let me know if you can see uh, my presentation in presentation mode. Uh, Just, uh, okay, share the screen and, uh, yeah. and now let me know, you can see it there, okay. Okay, can you see it well? Uh, it's not in presentation mode yet. And now, now it is, now it is. Yeah, okay, Fine. thank you. Excellent. Yeah, so our company, it's uh, Pellet Mexico. In Pellet Mexico, we're developing a very scarcely and uncharted territory, which is bioenergy for our country. And specifically within the bioenergy sector, the harnessing you know, of the agricultural, forestry, and organic waste to generate a renewable source of heat uh, through utilizing biomass as a raw material for combustion or through pelletizing processes. Um, well, we are we 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 are installing a circular economy model in which we based our production mostly on uh, residues from the food transformation industries, from the forestry sector, from the agricultural uh, production systems, to um, cut the demand of fossil fuels, mostly for Mexico, LPG gas and diesel oil, and does help uh, combat climate change by mitigating CO2 emissions. Um, our product is uh, solid biofuels, solid biofuels that come from different uh, feedstocks. Mostly we have pelletized uh, bamboo uh, pellets, uh, agave bagasse pellets, pine pellets, and uh, some other agricultural residue uh, for pellets. No? So, why Mexico, um, we developed and we started our project in 2014 as a research uh, analysis of market viability and commercial viability in our country. We founded Pellet Mexico in 2016 and mostly with a hypothesis that, uh, well, there, were, there, there would be this global need to mitigate CO2 emissions no? and the actions would be, uh, would get more radical in the, in, in, in the years to come. And we have a very, very interesting opportunity in our country. Uh, the last uh, study regarding biomass in our country um, counts you know, as, a, as a residual biomass energy potential as, as 1,600 petajoules, which is 
which is uh, a lot. Uh, in, and in the case of Pellet Mexico, uh, we're building, uh, we're creating a market where there is none. So actually in Mexico, we're the first uh, to market as an scalable and sustainable platform for uh, pellet production and biomass uh, and, and energetic use of, of biomass. So it's been a rough, uh, I would say that this experience has been a rough road uh, from where we founded the company till last year where we started our first plant operation, mostly because we have to develop the whole value chain for the creation of the market. And we did that with our uh, business model that I will tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so just to, just to draw some uh, interesting uh, market size uh, uh, considerations here, if we would substitute the national consumption in Mexico of LPG gas and diesel oil in the industrial, domestic, and uh, tourism sector, we would need 22 million tons of pellets per year. Uh, if we would concentrate only on the national consumption of LPG gas and diesel in the, in the, in the Mexican industrial sector, we would need around 4 million tons of pellets per year. So we have you know, uh, uh, a growth uh, strategy in which we 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 are we we want to produce 150,000 pellets of ton uh, tons of pellets per year in a in a six year period uh, in our country. Uh, so what's the business model of Pellet Mexico? And that way I can tell you a little bit more about our experience and and the lessons learned. Uh, so we did a very very ample uh, cartography of uh, residual biomass. You no, know, uh, not only theoretically, but mostly field experience uh, in, in our country to see where the big volumes of biomass were, who owned them, of what part of productive processes they, they were part of. And uh, we developed a business model that's mostly, I, I think that's, that's one of the main innovations of Pellet Mexico is developing this business model in which we, we partner with the local producers, companies uh, that own the residues. And with them, we invite them to invest in a pellet production plant, in a pellet production facility, in which we, in, in the foundational documents of those regional societies, of those regional business models, um, we guarantee the uh, supply of the feedstock. And that way, we also, uh, we also set in the price for, the, for a long-term purchase contract with our, our partners. And that way we, we, we mitigate a little bit of the risk uh, regarding price speculation. Once we uh, partner with, with, our, with, with, with them, we invest in the project and we do a, a commercialization strategy around 150 kilometers from our plant to where the demand is met, mostly in the industrial uh, sector. And that way we substitute you know, the thermal energy demand mostly of industrial, uh, of industrial, of industrial clients. Uh, so uh, the business strategy for us was to create the whole value chain uh, of from you know, identifying the different feedstocks to investing you know, in the plant and commission in the plant and thus selling uh, those pellets in a B2B strategy to our final clients in order for them to mitigate uh, CO2 emissions, but also to, transfer to them a competitive advantage. We, 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 can, we can cost cuts, uh, fuel costs by 20, 25% if we're talking about LPG gas and, and, and by almost 45% if we're talking of diesel oil in the Mexican, uh, in the Mexican market. Um, so, well, what are, we, what are we doing right now? We're doing uh, adaptation of industrial processes with uh, biomass burners. Uh, we are doing uh, medium, uh, medium scale uh, poly, um, poly biomass combustion uh, by, with, uh, with, with burners and also big uh, co-generation and generation uh, projects with different biomass uh, in the country. You know? And also we developed the domestic, no, and, 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 and hospitality uses for the heat, heating of water and heating uh, in general. Um, mostly we do it with European technology. So we've, we've decided to build uh, some uh, commercial representation with uh, both European 
pellet production technology and also with European combustion uh, technology. Uh, what's this strategic plan? No, I just told you about a strategic plan of five, six years. I'll tell you about the 10 uh, year plan. So we now have uh, three business regional units, which is Pellet Valle Bravo. It's a facility that has 3,000 tons per year pine uh, pellet capacity. Uh, pellet Chihuahua, which will start our operation uh, July this year. And Pellet Jalisco, which will start commissioning by the end of this year. Uh, these are our assets that are mostly fund, uh, that, that, that are based on woody biomass. Uh, but after 2024, we have a, a scalating uh, phase development period in which we want to use uh, mostly agricultural residues that are in big scale in different parts of the country. Uh, we're talking about mango seed pellets uh, in the southern part of Sinaloa, just in Sinaloa, in, those, in, in that south Southern Park region, you will find 103,000, uh, 130,000 tons per year of mango seed and peels uh, just in a, in a, in a region. No? Um, Pellet Coahuila, which will turn uh, avocado pits into solid biofuel uh, in, in Coahuila, where we have it till uh, 30,000, 50,000 uh, tons annually of avocado pit and peels. Uh, pellet Chiapas, which will use uh, palm rakis and uh, palm kernel shell for uh, energy uh, harnessing. So that's our strategic plan for, for the next 10 years. Right now, we are on a development phase. Uh, what's a development phase for us? It's, uh, as you can see, no, our, our plant no, in Pellet Valle Bravo, I will show you a little video. It's already uh, under production. Our plant in Chihuahua no, will be uh, we'll start, uh, I, I hope, you know, in, in, the, in the summer of this year, and Jalisco will start commissioning, uh, and then uh, Colima. No? What's the development phase? We, we need to have a product feed. Right now, we're producing pellets and we're selling the pellets. We have to have a very uh, strong uh, go-to-market strategy uh, built till 10,000 tons per year production this year and the closing of long-term supply contracts for us, which will lead us to our commercial and finance, financial consolidation. Uh, that's our, that's uh, the plant. Uh, I don't know if you can see the video, but that's our, our 3000 uh, ton uh, pellet production plant in uh, the state of Mexico. As you can see, we do have a rotary drum dryer uh, that we are uh, operating uh, right now in, in our facility in uh, the state of Mexico. Uh, our facility in Chihuahua, which is uh, two tons per hour uh, pine pellet facility, uh, we, our partner is a sawmill, sawmill operation and a, and a wood uh, operation facility, uh, which has uh, the capacity for providing 100% uh, of all the feedstock we need for this production. Uh, as you can see, this was in December last year, so we're finishing uh, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the local uh, installment of the plant. And when you can see this, all these are residues that come from the sawmill operation and from the wood uh, operation uh, that are totally base dried, some of them, and 35% uh, humidity in case of, um, of uh, wood chips. There you can see the kind of, uh, of, of, of product we will be working with. Um, and then we have, as I told you, this strategic plan you know, so that's, that entails scalability, which means opening regional market, expanding the supply and assurance of uh, feedstocks, scale our production uh, to 15,000 tons per year after 27 each year, uh, arrive at 200,000 tons per year in 10 years, in a conservative scenario, replicate our model and our business model in Latin America, and then access uh, the international export market. I think Mexico has a very interesting opportunity for the South South uh, East Asian market, um, given our geography. No, well, Pele Mexico was recognized as as, as one of the uh, one thousand efficient solutions by the Solar Impulse Foundation, and mostly what we you what, what what we do and here is our model. It's First, we try to see if we, if we have like strategic partners, which we close investment with, then we build a plant you know, and see where the demand uh, in, in nearby that plant is. And we transfer the both the sustainable and uh, economic uh, 
competency for our clients, no? And what, how do we identify these strategic alliances? Well, who is a waste generator and who can use that waste as its energy demand stream? Uh, and then, you no, know, who's the thermal energy consumer and how can we supply them of pellets or uh, do some strategic partnerships regarding uh, raw biomass? You no, know? for example, we are commissioning a project right now that um, uh, would use rackies, uh, palm rackies for the production of uh, steam, uh, big three, three very big uh, uh, production plants in Chiapas that would use palm rackies in order to have their steam uh, and their thermal energy. You know? So, well, that's in a nutshell, that's what we're doing in Pellet, Mexico. You have my contact details, you know, both here on the back and, and, and on the presentation. And um, I, I, would happy, I would be very happy to answer some questions if you have them. Thank you very much, Oscar. That was uh, very interesting. And I think, uh, I think I really you are enjoyed... muted, Christian, or I cannot hear you. Uh, can everybody else hear me? Can you hear me? OK. Then uh, it's not, <laughs> it's not okay, my okay. fault, uh, Oscar. I'm sorry. Um, oh, that's OK. Uh, thank you. I think it was very interesting to see this uh, business model oriented uh, presentation. Uh, as uh, balancing the more technical aspects that were uh, in the focus of the other uh, uh, presenters. So thank you very much for that, Oscar. I think we need to wrap it up. Uh, we have uh, uh, scheduled this for two hours, so uh, we need to close the session. I would like to thank all uh, uh, participants, uh, both the presenters and the participants that were joining our session. Uh, all the way through uh, the two, and, uh, two hours and 15 minutes. Um, the webinar will be online, as I, as I mentioned, we will also put the uh, presentations online. So feel free then to uh, contact the presenters to look at the details. Uh, I would like to also mention that the World Bioenergy Association has published a website, pellets.africa, that gives some instructions and ideas on how to develop pelleting projects. So you can have uh, use that as a resource uh, uh, also. That was it. Thank you very much. Goodbye and hope to see you in our next webinar. Bye. Thank you, Christian. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Bye thank, thank you. Bye, thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.